In our previous tutorials on rheology, we discussed a lot of what's. What are the essential elements of rheology? What deformation forces are materials likely to experience? And what do the flow profiles of various fluids look like? In this video, part four, we're going to examine how. How do rheological agents work the way they do to deliver rheology? And for that, we need to explore chemistry. Yeah, chemistry. Rheological agents can be classified based on how they function. They can either be non-associative or swelling types or associative, the adsorptive types. The swelling types can work in either clear formulations or formulations that contain components such as pigments, extenders, or matting agents. These swelling types affect the viscosity of the system's medium such as the organic solvent or the water phase of a formulation. In contrast, the adsorptive types requires a formula's components, pigments, extenders, or matting agents, to absorb onto, and thus form a network, or what I like to call, controlled agglomeration. Examples of swelling rheological agents include castor oil-based derivatives, silicas, and polyamides. And there are others, including organoclase, alkali swellable emulsions, and cellulosics. These non-associative types offer the appearance of swelling as they form a three-dimensional network with themselves and expand or swell by enclosing the formula's medium, solvent or water, within that network. The swelling mechanism works independently and can function in either clear systems or in formulations that contain other components. The associative types of rheological agents include oxidized polyolefins and hydrophobically modified ethoxylated urethanes, or URs. And there are many other types, like haze, hydrophobically modified alkali swellable emulsions, and urase, hydrophobically modified ethoxylated urethanes with an alkali swellable emulsion component. Again, these products absorb onto the surface of formulating components to form a network structure. And as you recall from a previous tutorial, a key requisite for rheology is morphology, and a network structure contributes to morphology. Let's first look at castor oil derivatives to understand how they create this network, this morphology, and thus rheology. Castor oil, like all vegetable oils, are triglycerides. A triglyceride is a triester of glycerol and three fatty acids. In this particular triglyceride, we show three different fatty acids. Stearic acid, which is fully saturated. Oleic acid, which has one site of unsaturation or one double bond. And linoleic acid, which has two sites of unsaturation or two double bonds. The predominant fatty acid in castor oil, however, is ricinoleic, an 18-carbon acid with one double bond and a pendant hydroxyl group. If we hydrogenate this oil, we eliminate the double bonds and we're left with 12-hydroxy stearic acid as the predominant fatty acid. Therefore, when we talk about castor oil derivatives as rheology modifiers, we're talking about hydrogenated castor oil. And it's the pendant hydroxyl groups bound to the ricinoleic acid that leads to hydrogen bonding, which in turn plays a major role in setting up a network structure. Let me show an example of hydrogen bonding between two carbon chains that contain hydroxyl groups. The electrostatic attraction of these molecules to each other 
develops a weak network which can be easily shattered with shear yet can rebuild again when the shear is reduced or eliminated. Let's now examine how hydrogen bonding accomplishes just that. Recall that an atom contains a nucleus with both protons and neutrons as well as orbiting electrons at various energy levels or electronic shells. The number of electrons equals the number of protons in an uncharged or electrically neutral atom. The number is also the atom's atomic number. The innermost shell has a maximum of two electrons and the next two electron shells can each have a maximum of eight electrons. This is known as the octet rule which states that, with the exception of the innermost shell, atoms are most stable when they have eight electrons in their outermost shell, or what we call the valence shell. Now the element hydrogen, with an atomic number of one, has only one electron orbiting its nucleus. It would prefer to complete its shell with a second electron and become more stable. One way to achieve that is to share its electron with another hydrogen atom and thus have both electrons orbiting around the two nuclei. So a pure covalent bond is established where the electrons are shared equally between the two atoms. Now oxygen, with an atomic number of eight, has eight orbiting electrons distributed over two energy level shells. Shell one is already complete with two electrons, but shell two, its valence shell, has only six electrons. It needs two more to complete its shell and become stable. So how do we accomplish that? Now before we get into that, let me first explain an atom's electronegativity, which is the atom's propensity to attract electrons towards itself. And the higher the electronegativity, the stronger the attraction. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.2. Recall that when we place two hydrogen atoms next to each other, they equally shared a total of two electrons. Of course they would. Each atom is the same with the same electronegativity. One has no more influence over the other in terms of attracting electrons. Oxygen, on the other hand, has a higher electronegativity of 3.44. Of course it would be higher since its outer shell has six electrons, needs two more to complete its shell, and therefore is three quarters of the way there. So its desire to pull electrons towards itself is greater than then hydrogen with its one electron. As a result of oxygen taking more than its fair share of electron density, it becomes slightly negative. And at the same time, the hydrogen atom, now having less than its fair share of electron density, becomes slightly positive. This is described as a polar bond. So now let's return to the hydrogenated castor oil molecule. This is one possible configuration of the triester, where the three fatty acids are lined up to one side, or alternatively, it can orient like this. Let's highlight the ester groups as well as the hydroxyl groups with their respective electrostatic charge. Now let's view the resulting attraction between the hydroxyl groups as a result of hydrogen bonding. In this configuration, we have a hydroxyl group on one end of the molecule, ester groups in the middle, and hydroxyl groups on the other end. molecules congregate with each other to form needle-like structures which in turn forms a network and develops morphology, a requisite for rheology. Here is a ball and stick representation of the molecules. Notice when these molecules form a network due to hydrogen bonding, we have pockets or voids for pigments extenders, or other formulation components to nest or be suspended in. And if we were to apply shear, the hydrogen bonding will be temporarily broken, the network collapses, and viscosity is reduced. 
similar to the collapse of a house of cards when sheared. When shear is reduced or eliminated, the network will rebuild itself, viscosity will rise, and suspension of the formulation components is restored. While castor oil derivatives are excellent in low polar, aliphatic solvent-based systems, such as alkyds, their ester backbone can be solubilized in higher polar, aromatic or oxygenated type systems. And if they're solubilized, that would prevent morphology. And as you recall from the video in part one of our series, morphology is a requisite for rheology. Also, even in low polar systems, if the processing temperatures become too high, the hydrogenated castor oil particles can dissolve and upon cooling can potentially form a tighter network structure in the form of crystalline masses or seeds. Polyamides undergo the same swelling process as castor-based products, develop the same type of network structure via hydrogen bonding, but will not solubilize in higher polar solvents nor contribute to seeding as a result of higher processing temperatures. One way to produce polyamides is by making use of the fatty acids found in hydrogenated castor oil and reacting them with a difunctional aliphatic or aromatic amine. The resulting molecule now has an amide backbone instead of an ester along with the pendant hydroxyl groups for hydrogen bonding. Because the product is a polyamide and not a polyester, it offers higher melting point where overheating the system is no longer a major problem. And it offers lower solubility for use in a broader range of nonpolar and polar systems. Let's synthesize one example of a polyamide. If we react two molecules of 12-hydroxysteric acid, the same acid found in hydrogenated castor oil with one molecule of a diamine, in this case, ethylene diamine, we've created a diamide. Interestingly, we now have one molecular chain with two hydroxyl groups, unlike the hydrogenated castor oil with one hydroxyl group per molecular chain. This gives us an extra degree of association to hydrogen bond with itself, form a more resilient network or morphology develop higher molecular weights, and achieve higher heat resistance. Let's view an animation of how polyamides network together via hydrogen bonding. Here we have a product with a hydroxyl group on one end, a polyamide group in the middle, and a second hydroxyl group on the other end. Naturally, the molecules will congregate with each other via hydrogen bonding. Notice how the extra hydroxyl group on the same molecular chain allows an additional degree of association which develops a stronger three-dimensional network. Once again, a ball and stick representation of the molecules. The network is now primed to entangle pigments, extenders, matting agents, or other formula components which will prevent settling. And as before, if we were to apply shear, the hydrogen bonding will break, the network will collapse, and the viscosity will drop. Let's now examine an associative or adsorptive type of rheological additive, your hydrophobically modified ethoxylated urethanes. When rheological agents form associations with a formula's components, such as pigments, resins, or additives, they produce a sort of co-agglomeration. This mechanism not only supports a network for morphology and, of course, rheology, but there is an added side benefit. In the event that any component has a high specific gravity and the potential to settle, it will result in soft settling since all the components are bound to each other in this weak 
conglomerated state. Therefore, the end product can be easily reconstituted with mild mixing. Let's see how an associated rheological additive works. Here is a generic example of a hydrophobically modified ethoxylated urethane. The central core is a chain of ethylene oxide links which provides the hydrophilic or water-loving moiety and associates with the continuous medium of water. The terminating hydroxyls of the ethylene oxide chain is reacted with a diisocyanate to form a urethane. And the end blocks of that urethane are hydrophobic, which can associate with pigment, resin, or additives. Let's view an animation of how associative rheological additives network together via adsorption. First, we'll fill our screen with water. Let's add a your molecule. We have a product with a hydrophobic moiety on one end, a central hydrophil via the ethylene oxide chain, and a hydrophobic component on the opposite end. Let's add more molecules of your. Notice how they will associate with each other via a hydrophobe to hydrophobe attraction. Now let's introduce some pigment and resin. A network will form where the hydrophobe associates with the pigment and resin and the hydrophil associates with the water phase. As a result, we have various combinations. Pigment to pigment, pigment to resin, resin to resin, or resin to pigment association. This network, or co-agglomeration, helps prevent settling. Now let's introduce some shear. The network disassociates due to the deformation force applied and viscosity drops. When the force is reduced or eliminated, the network will rebuild and viscosity will be restored. Recall from our part three tutorial on flow profiles, if viscosity recovery is instantaneous, the material is considered pseudoplastic or strictly shear dependent. If viscosity recovery is slower, allowing time for flow and leveling, the material is thixotropic, shear and time dependent. I hope this tutorial gives you a better appreciation of how some rheological agents work. An understanding of chemistry and mechanism allows a formulating chemist to select the most appropriate raw material for a specific formulation or system. Whether it's waterborne or solventborne, whether the solvent is polar or nonpolar, or whether the end product is clear or pigmented. In our next and final tutorial, we'll examine how rheology is measured using the latest equipment, methods, and techniques.